everyone. So 2020 has definitely been a roller coaster of a year in a lot of different ways, but it has turned out very well for me in terms of what I like to talk about mainly on this channel, which is investing and investing in such a way as to beat the markets and beat the crowd. And as remarkable as this sounds, I achieved a 170% return on investment this year, which is by far the best year I've had so far. Also, this channel has recently passed 1,000 subscribers, so as a sort of a New Year's gift, I've decided to show you the positions I had this year, and still have to hopefully give you an idea of both my thinking behind these positions and what this looked like this year for me, so stay tuned. Hi everybody, welcome back to The Contrarian. My name's Logan, I really like to talk about overall success in investing, as well as going against crowd thinking mentality within the investing world and elsewhere, so if you like these kinds of topics, uh, just consider to subscribe to this channel, and I want to make a few brief disclaimers here before I get started. First of all, this is not to be taken as financial advice in any way, shape, or form, and also I'm not saying that this kind of return can be expected um, with this sort of investing mentality, or that you will necessarily even beat the markets. And this is just supposed to be a summary of this last year and the different uh, thinking I had going into these two positions that I had. So I want to begin saying that the majority of these gains I made was by value investing. It was not by day trading or following some trading algorithm. So it was actually not time intensive at all once I got it going. Uh, I've tried trading before and this is something big that nobody talks about. It's just so tiring and time intensive. To do that um, and it hasn't worked out as well for me so my first big observation is that value investing is just so much more relaxing and you can actually just let it work without paying any attention to it you can just check on it a couple times a day um, you don't have to sit in front of a computer non-stop um, once you find a good company or a good set of companies to buy into you buy in at the lowest possible price and wait for it to reach the price target you have or the valuation you think that this company deserves. Um, so around the beginning of 2020 and the end of 2019, I began to have major, a major contrarian bet in mind. And this uh, contrarian idea had to do with the common narrative out there that was going around and that still is going around to some extent that, you know, because Amazon, Alibaba, um, Overstock, you know, all these other online retailers are eating up business from physically based retailers. Therefore, these traditionally physical retailers will face difficulty staying above water and they should be avoided. Um, that was the central thinking of the crowd and most investors is, you know, hey, Amazon is going to continue to take the lunches from these brick and mortar retailers, so you should avoid them. So I started to question this mentality out there and actually look into these overlooked stocks that most people weren't even examining. And I ended up pretty quickly finding that in most situations, yes, these companies were certainly not doing well currently and they likely wouldn't do well in the future. And they were not trying to convert to an e-commerce business. However, I did end up finding a couple of exceptions to this rule. And the more I looked into them, the more I couldn't believe the value that was being overlooked in these two companies. And these companies were GameStop and Bed Bath and & Beyond. And I've talked about GameStop before. I've made a few videos about them in the past, but I think Bed Bath & Beyond is kind of a new one for you guys. I haven't talked about that. Um, and now I'm sure you've probably heard of these two businesses before. GameStop is a video game retailer that specializes in selling video game consoles and discs and basically all the bells and whistles that goes along with gaming, which is quite a lot more than I thought it is initially. And they are also the reseller of used products, so they'll buy back, you know, old PS4, old PS3 stations and games and resell them, and this has been and continues to be a very profitable part of their business. And now Bed Bath & Beyond is a home furnishing store and sells pretty much anything you can think of related to you know, interior home decor and furnishings, kitchenware, bathroom, etc. So this is the background of these companies, and right out from the beginning, they might seem like an ordinary, you know, boring physical retailer that was soon to go out of business and be the next, you know, JCPenney or Sears. And because of this, the valuations of these companies were very beaten down. In the case of GameStop, it was trading at below the shareholder equity value for over a year. Um, so people were especially pessimistic about GameStop. And this was only further supported by the fact that GameStop was the most shorted stock in the New York Stock Exchange for, I believe, 
over a year, and it still is. Uh, for GameStop, you know, it seemed that gaming was shifting to digital. People were ordering gaming consoles from Amazon and other e-commerce retailers, and people just generally hated this company. <laughs> and for Bed Bath & Beyond, people just saw it as a boring and uninspiring retailer that had little hope of reviving to its previous highs. And similar to GameStop, um, that it would face a gradual death from Amazon and other e-commerce giants. So on the surface, these companies didn't seem that great, and I actually wasn't very optimistic about them at first. But they did have major tailwinds that eventually caught my attention. Uh, for Bed Bath & Beyond, it was management and the changes COVID caused earlier in 2020. And Bed Bath & Beyond had newly appointed uh, CEO Mark Tritton, and Tritton had a had helped um, to revitalize and reshape the structure of Target. Um, before Triton came in, Target was in pretty bad condition as well, um, and he helped them to basically restructure their customer rewards programs, boost e-commerce to be more competitive with the likes of Walmart and Amazon, and he also restructured the stores, um, cutting out ones that were not profitable and renovating the ones that were old and grungy and uninviting. So by adding him in to a similar company, in similar circumstances seemed to be a great tailwind for Bed Bath & Beyond. And if he could do it once at Target, he could do it again with you know Bed Bath & Beyond. That was my basic thinking. And also, with everyone staying at home during the COVID lockdowns, and now being forced to work at their homes and do school at their homes and pretty much everything else at their homes, this seemed like it would induce much more demand for these types of products that Bed Bath & Beyond is selling. You know, it, now that people are basically in their houses a lot more than usual, they begin to notice a lot of these discrepancies that they've been wanting to repair or replace a lot of these older things they've been having, so that seemed like a major tailwind for Bed Bath & Beyond. And for GameStop, they also had a newly appointed CEO, George Sherman, who was shaking things up. He was doing a similar strategy <coughs> of shifting the business to curbside pickup and online delivery, and likewise he was also closing excess stores that were not profitable and that were essentially cannibalizing sales from other GameStop stores. So he was closing kind of redundant stores that were you know, very close to each other and didn't need to be there. Um, and GameStop already had a lot of cash on their balance sheet and selling all this retail made it a lot stronger. And for me, looking at it in early 2020, it clearly would make it to the end of 2020 when the PS5 and the new Xbox were coming out and for those who remember, these don't come out every year, but when they do, sales go through the roof, and likewise, GameStop's stock has correlated heavily with the years after these new consoles have been released, and, you know, they produce a much higher profitability than previous years. And think also of what COVID did to the gaming industry. People were stuck in their houses, and because of this, they went out and bought gaming consoles and products in record numbers. And with COVID still being a thing in this you know, stay-at-home trend is still going on, this is likely going to produce a record Q4 earnings for the gaming industry as a whole, and these PS5 and new Xbox uh, were rep repeatedly sold out. I mean, they're extremely hard to get right now. Um, so that's likely going to lead to, you know, extremely strong earnings coming up. So basically, I decided to take positions in these two companies, uh, with GameStop being the largest position, simply of how undervalued it was. Um, it was just a much better price for me to pick it up at. I purchased GameStop at an average of $6 per share in May, and Bed Bath & Beyond for an average of around $8 per share in June. And long story short, I sold out of Bed Bath & Beyond at roughly $20 toward the end of this year. And this essentially had to do with the thinking on my part that with a lot of the hype um, dying down from the same day delivery announcement that they released, in their earnings report, this was what uh, drove the share price up over $25, and $20 was roughly the valuation I thought was reasonable. Um, so I sold out of that, but I'm still very optimistic about GameStop going forward into 2021, uh, with Ryan Cohen putting major pressure on the management to further push GameStop to be a leader in the gaming world, and being more of a social hub, and definitely driving more of their sales to online. So I'm still very optimistic about GameStop in terms of their valuation. I don't think they're actually anywhere close to what their potential could be, especially if Ryan, you know, pushes to put himself or other people from his 
a venture capital firm onto the board or even eventually taking over the company. Uh, this would be a very beneficial move for shareholder optimism to have the guy who built Chewy, you know, the dog food and dog, the, the pet uh, retailer, um, you know, to have that guy either on the board or being the CEO. Um, and GameStop also had their, you know, recent revenue sharing agreement with Ry Microsoft that was revealed in October. Um, they still have Q4 earnings to come out, which, as I previously said, are probably going to be pretty historical in my opinion, so I remain very optimistic about my largest position, which is still in GameStop. Um, and now I'll just address a few things. So conventional wisdom would lead to believe that only having two positions is not being well diversified, and this therefore dramatically increases risk. And this is true to a certain extent, and everyone's tolerance for risk is different. Um, again, this isn't advice, but me being young in my 20s, I can and probably should take more risk in investing than someone who's about to retire. Uh, every investment has risk in it, um, but taking educated risk when you're younger can really be a great boost to yourself later on. Uh, when you're young, you can make up for it with time, but when you're older, you should probably trim back on the risk and focus on steady returns. Um, and But however, I might point out that other people such as Warren Buffett at certain times have been very concentrated in investing positions. Um, even right now, he's very concentrated. He's had large, even majority, you know, over 50% of his portfolio in different companies over the years, such as Coca-Cola, Bank of America, and now Apple. Uh, these have all been extremely large positions for Berkshire Hathaway over the years. Um, and also, it's just very hard to find a lot of great companies to invest into. Like I just laid out, I only found two and this took a lot of time uh, on my part to just do my due diligence to find these two companies. So to say that I need to find at least 10 or 20 to be well diversified, at least for me, would just lead to me picking some generalized companies that I had not you know, thoroughly looked into and inevitably picking at least one that didn't end up doing well. So that's the trouble with diversification is that you inevitably are um, going to pick some losers. Like in index funds, you just you're buying the index fund, you really have a very little idea of all of these individual companies, you know, however many it is, 30 or 500 or 2,000. Um, I always say this, but if you want to outperform the market and outperform the crowd, you have to do what the crowd is not doing. And you have to weed out a lot of these losers that they are including in their portfolios. Um, and another reason why this made sense for me is just that there were very asymmetrical investments for me to take. Um, by asymmetrical, I mean there was much more uh, possible return than there was risk. Uh, think about these two companies. Um, they had just hit multiple year, if not all-time lows before I bought them. And at the very worst, they could go back down to these lows or even lower. But in comparison to where they had been in the past and where I perceived they could go, there was much, much more upside than there was downside. So these were very asymmetrical uh, investments for me to take. So as you might see, uh, this way of thinking worked out well for me in the last you know six to eight months since I started these positions. And that's um, you know as for what I'm looking at in 2021, other than GameStop, I'm not really sure. Um, I haven't seen anything that looks undervalued right now that these companies were like last year. Um, and if anything, the market right now is, as a whole is looking extremely overvalued in my opinion. So this, for, for me anyways, this might just be a year of more waiting and learning. Um, and anyway, thank you guys for being a great audience in 2020. I know this has been a strange year for all of us, but hopefully this new year will be even better. Uh, so yeah, if you guys want to hear more topics like this, just consider subscribing and hitting the like button, and I hope to see you again.